All right, well, why don't we get started, guys? Um, and I want to finish off this lecture because I want to start in on uh, the next lecture today. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to get it done, but um, I want to finish off the uh, sort of the safari that we're on, sort of the first lecture of soil ecology. And we were on this last uh, of, the, of the classification schemes. Again, why you look at or the question that you have is going to direct what you're looking at. Okay, or another way of saying it, how you look at something sort of directs what you're asking, the kinds of questions that you're asking. Okay, so one of the classification things, one of the ways that we look at stuff, how we classify, is basically um, uh, SR 16S uh, rRNA sequencing. It's basically uh, we're looking at literally the genes. Okay, we're looking at the RNA not necessarily the DNA, we're looking at the RNA, but we're looking at a relatively conserved component of our body that we can watch it change over time. Okay? And that sequencing basically has broken up life into sort of three components. Eukaryotes, eubacteria, and archaeobacteria. And uh, I just wanted to sort of walk us through this diversity that's here and to a certain extent its function. So you give guys, in essence, a safari. <coughs> So eukaryotes are a large group. Uh, they include plants, fungi, animals, the ciliates, the flagellates, as well as the slime molds. We often have a hard time re realizing that we're related to slime molds in a sense. Okay. Um, when we talk about this, we often think of sort of the non-animal groups. So we're looking at the plants, from large to small plants, algae, fungi, the slime molds, and some protozoa. When we talk about animals, we're looking at small, again, large to small, you know, elephants and you know, gophers, but we're really talking about soil organisms here. Gophers, moles, prairie dog, earthworms, slugs, all the way down to the nematodes. Okay? Generally, the things that you would think of as plants or animals fall into this group. Okay? From a plant sense, um, it, plants are kind of interesting. Uh, I, I, I've been sort of making this case that, you know, all this stuff is happening because the bacterial populations are driving nutrient cycling. But the reality is that this is a two-way street. And plants are a really good example of how these systems work. Okay? Plants, obviously they're photosynthesizing, they're taking carbon, inorganic carbon, and turning it into organic form. Okay? So, but they're doing more than that. Okay? They're basically supporting, a, well, I guess it's the same thing. I mean, they're, they're basically supporting an ecosystem. Okay? And the ecosystem, when we're talking about soils, a lot of that ecosystem is basically existing in the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is the root zone, okay? the root sphere. Okay, now here are these plants photosynthesizing, lights coming in, they're photosynthesizing, they're putting biomass out, and in their root system, they're basically putting exudates out. Now, these exudates can be, they could be doing this intentionally because they're trying to harvest something, okay, but it also could be unintentionally where the plants are sloughing off skin, like we slough off skin cells, the plants are doing the same thing, okay. Well, that material that they are exudating basically becomes a food stock or a nutrition stock for organisms that are around that live in this root zone. Now it turns out if you look at the soil as a whole, the highest concentrations of organisms in the soil are basically sitting in these rhizospheres. They're sitting in this zone that is being influenced by plants. Okay? Now, these exudates sort of stimulate fungi as well as bacterial growth and often will have 10 to 100 more microbes than in the bulk soil. Okay? <coughs> now, the relationship with these roots, these roots host harmless as well as parasitic as well as symbiotic organisms. Some of the soil organisms, the soil animals that you'll see out there are the nematodes, insects, slugs, and earthworms. We're going to be seeing in the next couple weeks, we're going to be seeing a lot of earthworms, we're going to be seeing a number of nematodes, but a lot of different types of insects that are living in this soil environment. Okay? Uh, these are all basically heterotrophic organisms. There are some exceptions. Uh, well, with soil animals, they're all basically heterotrophic. They're all aerobic, mobile, mostly in topsoil and litter. There's few in compacted and very wet soils. The few is because they're aerobic. <coughs> the protozoa and algae are very active and abundant in these wet soils. Okay? The algae basically are single cell phototrophs. Okay? So they're not the heterotrophs that we think of as the soil animals. Uh, the protozoa are non photosynthetic, but they are also single celled, but they are organotrophs. Okay? This population is very mobile. 
and they prey very much on that bacterial population. Okay, so these guys are sort of those uh, predatory. They're uh, on the trophic scale. They're the predator, the predators. Fungi is another large group of this. They're active and abundant in most normal in most soils. Uh, the soils normally have to be moist and aerated for these fungi, fungal populations to survive. They're organic trophic. Okay. They include the yeast population. So those of you that are interested in uh, fermentation, pickling, and beer making, and wine, this is that population. Okay. They include molds. So they're strictly aerobic. These guys, they're filamentous often, uh, actually all the time. And they ex uh, extend, they can ins extend really large distances, centimeters to, in some cases, meters and excess. Okay. The fungi, the largest organism, I, can, I always forget where this is. I want to say, Washington State or something like that. There, did we talk? Did I say this already? Did I mention this already? The largest organism in the world is a mold or is a fungus. It's a, it's a, a it's I, maybe it's maybe it's Oregon, but it's out west someplace. Does anybody know where it is exactly? It's in Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Um, the importance of these guys, are, you know, there's a lot of <coughs> interest right now in something that's called glomalin. Glomalin is a sort of a, a, a exudate. It's a part of, uh, it's actually a lot of organisms do it. It's a, stress or, or, uh, it's a stress protein, but what it does in soils is it tends to create aggregates. And a lot of what these, what we think of as granular structure, a lot of that's actually associated with the sort of the mycelia aggregates that are coming from the fungi. Okay, the mycelia are basically moving through the soil and they're basically creating sort of um, aggregates because as they're, it's basically sort of like a web, a, a root web. These mycelia spread out and they surround things. Okay, and then the proteins that are a part of this, this fungi mycelium, glomalin being one of them, basically stabilize this aggregate. Okay, and it's so it's a huge, there's a lot of interest in this, this, this component of, of fungi. Um, it's often also very much associated with plant roots. <coughs> okay, the next group is the eubacteria. These eubacteria are what we would think of, as most of us would think of as bacteria, but there's another group we'll talk about next, which are archaebacteria, which are slightly different, but they're s this sort of s very small single cell organism that are not necessarily aerobic. Okay. Some of the important and really interesting kind of bacteria, I threw two of them out here um, because you guys are probably familiar with these even though you don't know it. The first one is actinomyces. It's a class of bacteria that are very common in soils. Uh, they're rod shaped as well as filamentous. Um, these guys are, you know when you pick up a soil and you smell it and it smells healthy? This is actually the microorganism that you, that's, that's often associated with that smell. Okay, these guys tend to be fairly sensitive to toxicity and things like that. So when a soil gets degraded, these are some of the things that sort of disappear. Okay, Pseudomonas at the other end, there's uh, lots and lots of different types of Pseudomonases. But the interesting thing about these guys is that some of these guys can use over 100 different organic compounds to survive. Uh, a lot of these guys, there's a lot of interest in these guys because of their ability to degrade things. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, mediation, remediation technology is sort of centered around some of these guys. Um, this, this group also includes the nit nitrogen-fixing bacteria, uh, which we've talked a lot about. These guys that convert the, the N2 basically to ammonium, but they prefer to use ammonium if available, and we've talked about why, because this is a very energetic process to convert that N2 to, to ammonium. Okay? So if ammonium is present, they're basically going to be using that. Um, there's a whole group of different nitrogen-fixing bacteria, the rhizobia and the bradyrhizobia. rhizobia. Basically, these are the leguminous organisms that, that create those nodules in the legumes. There's a zodobacter, which are basically free-living. And there's a spirella. These guys are basic. These are nitrogen fixers er, as well. And they have basically loose symbiotic relationships with some tropical crops, grasses, and grains. Okay? Most of what we talk about around here are the rhizobium species. But there are a lot of other nitrogen-fixing organisms out there. All right, that means this to archaebacteria. Uh, I apologize if this is going really fast, but I want to get to the next lecture, and this is more of a safari anyway. Um, the archaebacteria are sort of broken up into three different large groups. One is the extreme halophiles. When you take halo, basically means salt. Okay, 
the methanogens and the extreme thermophiles, so extreme temperature. <coughs> of these guys, um, methanogens are really kind of interesting. Um, they basically are, are methane producing, um, they're strictly anaerobic and they produce methane. Okay? Um, they also can produce some other things, but they're basically autotrophic. They're basically taking CO2 and, and, and high protons and basically making methane and water. Okay? So um, there's a number of other things that they, these methanogens are associated with, carbon monoxide, formate, methyl substances, and acetate. Okay? Um, there's also these extreme thermophiles. These guys are really actually, they're really important to microbiology right now. Um, do, do, does anybody know what PCR is? Polymerase chain reaction. It's a technique that's basically used to amplify um, uh, proteins, DNA, RNA proteins. Um, and the, uh, the thought is, what you can do is you can take an organism, and if you want to find out what, you know, if you want to explore this organism, well, this organism might not have a, a lot of the protein that you're interested in. Okay? And if it's at a very low concentration, it's going to make it very hard for you to discover things about it. You want to have a large amount of it so that you can do stuff. Okay? Well, it turns out that PCR is a technique that comes from, okay, well, why would I want to use PCR? Well, I want to be able to amplify it and make more of it so that I can take a look at it. Okay? Well, it turns out this technology came from a thermophilic microorganism, an archaeobacteria, that was found basically in Yellowstone. Okay? Basically, you're taking an organism that was living in one of these geyser ponds, okay? extreme hot temperature, Okay, and they were from this organism. They found this. Basically, it was a, I think it was basically a protein that, for whatever reason, amplifies other proteins. Okay, and so they were basically using this organism to basically advance science in that sense. Okay, it's a very dumbed down version of the whole story, but it's actually a really interesting story. Um, so questions. Are we good? I know that was really fast. I apologize, but I wanted to get on to the next lecture. Go. I have a quick question back on the methanogens. Those other compounds that you list, those are other things that they produce? Uh, they, so, so they can also, some of them can also produce formate, not No, no, no. I, I think this is, these are things that they, um, they, they use. They consume those. Yeah. They yeah. Yeah. Okay, questions? We're good? Good? All right. All right. Um, so we've talked about, I mean, we just finished this lecture. We talked about why we look at things, OK, and, 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 and the classification based on what we're interested in. So what I'd like to do today is think about what, what they're doing on the landscape, the effect of soil organisms on the environment. Okay? Now, at this point, we've done this safari. You've got like, everything from nitrogen fixation to you know, I don't know, structural type of development, things like that. But I'd like to start taking a look at two sort of very interesting groups of organisms that are in the soil and sort of follow what they do. Okay. Now, I start with this slide. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this sort of, this is the classic sort of soil science slide where you have a, hold, a hand holding some soil. Um, but I want us to start this lecture by thinking about what's going on in this. Okay. This is the volume of soil. Okay. Now, it could be in the soil landscape someplace. It could be in a pot. It could be, but what's going on in here? Now, Carl Sagan never said this, but he's often attributed to saying, you know, there's billions and billions of stars in the galaxy. Um, he never actually said that. But we often say, you know, there are billions and billions of, of microorganisms of organisms living in a grain of sand or in a, in a two, teaspoon of soil. Have you guys ever heard that? You know, there's, there's a multitude of organisms just in the teaspoon of soil. And the reality is, there's more organisms standing underneath you than there is above you, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, let's actually talk about what's going on in here. And what are the organisms that are in this space and how they have an effect on this volume? Now, usually when we think about this, this is, this is the picture that we come up with. 
Okay, we sort of, you know, it's a sort of the trophic, the classic trophic graph. Okay, where we're looking at primary pr primary producers, primary consumers, and so on, all the way up to the detrite of ores. Okay, and then starting the cycle again. Okay, but I'd like you guys to think about it in another sense. <coughs> I'd like you to think about it in a sense of of, of form, yes, yeah, certainly form and function, which you sort of see here. But I also want you to think about it in a sense of diversity and what that diversity is creating. Now, you've seen a slide that's very similar to this earlier, okay? And when we think about this diversity, we talk about, the, you know, these, this is size, genetics, energy, and trophic level. Did we just talk about that? Basically, the four ways that we classify things, okay? But I want you to think about this diversity about in the sense of what are these organisms actually doing? Okay, yes, we're interested in them and then we're gonna classify them that way and that's why we classify them that way, but what are they actually doing? And to think about how, what they're actually doing, let's think about where they are and their numbers and their forms and all the things that we've basically just talked about in the last lecture. Okay, so biomass, okay, here's that mushroom that's sitting out in Oregon someplace. It's not a mushroom, it's a fungi, okay? The number, this is one organism, we have earthworms, we have all the way down to bacteria, an abundance of these guys. Where they are, okay? Dry versus wet, cold versus hot. And what they actually do in that system, their functions within that system. So let's think of them as a functional relationship. What's going on functionally? Okay. So these soil organisms play these critical roles. What are these functions? Okay. It turns out these functions are basically, they can be beneficial, they can be neutral, and they can be detrimental. And what I'm going to do is we're going to look at a model system. The model system we're going to be looking at is earthworms. And we're basically going to be looking at three things that this earthworm does, or earthworms do. Issues of soil structure, issues of infiltration and aeration, and then finally, carbon and nutrient cycling. Okay, so let's start with an earthworm. There's our earthworm. Okay. This is basically a Wikipedia poll. I just pulled it straight from Wikipedia. What is an earthworm? Well, it's a tube-shaped, segmented animal that is commonly found living in soil. Its di digestive system runs straight through its body, and it conducts uh, respiration through cuticles covering its skin. It has a simple closed, cell, uh, closed blood cell circulation system. They're hermaphroditic. Um, uh, they are an invert as an invertebrate, it lacks a skeleton, but it, earthworms maintain its structure with basically fluid-filled s systems. These fluid-filled systems basically help with mobility. Okay, P basically this is a Wikipedia poll. This is what you would get if you pulled on Wikipedia. Okay. <coughs> so let's take a look at soil structure, infiltration and aeration, and nutrient cycling. What is this worm actually doing? Okay, let's start with soil structure. Okay, generally when we think of soil structure, can you guys see this slide? Yeah? Generally when we think of soil structure, this is what we think of when we talk about worms. The worm casts. You know, it comes out in a rain or you go out to the soil, uh, the field, and you can see these sort of casts coming out of the soil. Okay, this is the detritus coming out of the tail end of the worm. Okay, it's not poop like we would think of it as poop. Turns out that worms are gut, basically they have they are gut grinders, they're gut fermenters, okay? And they have to have rocks and things like that in their stomach to help grind things up, okay? They eat the material, they go through their sink, they're basically one large stomach, which is in essence what we are in a sense. One large stomach, okay? And this stuff comes out the tail end. Now, interestingly enough, this is a lot more stable structurally than the surrounding soil. Now, this is a piece of wood that somebody put the cast on, but now, if we're going to be thinking about this issue of where these casts are, we have to think about the number of worms. Okay, now this is a, a slide that I, well, this is actually the data that I pulled from uh, online. And basically what this is, is it's, we're looking at earthworm densities, not the casts, the density of earthworms in a silty clay loam field, basically in Indiana. Okay, and been, this, they've been looking at a variety of different field treatments for at least 10 years. Okay, they've got continuous corn plowed versus no plowed, soybean versus no, uh, ver soybean plowed versus no till, bluegrass clover, dairy pasture with manure, and a dairy pasture manure with heavy application. And look at the distribution of organisms, or I should say the number of these organisms. Okay, 
plowed versus no plow, plow versus no, or plowed versus no till, plow versus no till, corn versus soybean, grass system, a manure system, and a lot of food coming into that manure system. So if you just look at this slide, what is it telling you? They like manure, and they also like the no-till. Okay? But even in the no-till system, the earthworms here in the bluegrass clover mix, they're certainly higher than this. So there's a lot of things going on that affect their distribution. Certainly feedstock, certainly disturbance, certainly the type of feedstock and the amount of feedstock. Make sense? So with that type of disturbance, these types of disturbances and that kind of population, what do you think is going to be happening with casts? Where are we going to have more casts? Pretty straightforward. We're basically looking at a trend from least casts to most casts. Now, an interesting experiment, Charles Darwin, uh, he was very interested in earthworms. Okay? He did an experiment where he basically spread chalk over his backyard. Okay? And then he went away for 30 years and came back. Actually, he did a lot of other things in that 30 years. Uh, he came back, and then he dug in, in 29, and 29 years later, he dug into the soil to basically fair, find where that chalk line was. The chalk line was six inches underground, six inches below the surface. Now, he spread the chalk at the surface. What had happened? Now, we don't have soil genesis this fast. And it's, even if we did have soil genesis this fast, we wouldn't be seeing the chalk line going this way. So what was going on here? This is all earthworm casts. In, in 30 years, he had developed six inches of earthworm casts. That's where the chalk line went. Okay? Just to give you an idea about, you know, here's that abundance. Oops. Here's that abundance. Now, do you think I would be getting six inches of earthworm casts here? Potentially here, though. Okay, so we got the casts. Now let's think about what other things that earthworms do. They are certainly boring lots and lots of holes. Now this is a, a simulated earthworm. Can you guys see the lines here? Jean-Marc, can you kill another bank of lights? Now this is a simulated earthworm track. This is basically four earthworms. Can you guys see it now? Verizon, can you hear it now? No, can you see it now, sort of, ish? OK. What you're looking at here is basically four simulated earthworm tracks. Four earthworms. Now, what do you think would have happened if we were looking at that heavily manured field? If this is just four, they were looking at 1,300 earthworms. What's that going to do to the aeration and porosity of these soils? Dramatic increase. I mean, pretty straightforward. It's a dramatic increase. If we have that dramatic increase, what is it going to do to aeration and infiltration? A lot faster infiltration rates, and aeration is going to be a lot better. Okay? What's the effect of that on nutrient cycling and everything else that's going on in these soils? Right? We're moving materials. We're increasing materials coming in, or increasing the rates of materials. We're also oxygenating the system. If we're oxygenating the system, we're increasing decomposition rates. We're in, in basically increasing respiration rates. So things are going to be a lot more driven or faster. All right. <clears throat> this is an experiment where they're basically looking at macropore abundance. Okay? And what they're looking at is large versus small macropores. Okay? And what you're looking at here is earthworm populations. This is an ambient condition. They basically left the population alone. This population, they basically reduced it. In this population, they basically added more worms. And what do you see? All across, you basically see an increase, dramatic increase in the macropores, smaller increase in the micropores. So what's going on? Yes, more population, you get more pores. But what's driving that besides the number of, actually, the number of organisms? Here's another experiment where we're looking at cumulative infiltration rate in three hours. And we're looking at the types of residue present, none versus soybeans, 
and we're looking at basically three different treatments of worms. None, 15 earthworms and 30 earthworms. Okay? If there was no earthworms, okay, <coughs> the lighter color is the none. Okay, so you would think this is actually sort of inverted, which you, what, how most people would do it. This is none, this is 15, this is 30. This is none, this is 15, this is 30. Okay? When there is no food present in the system, are the, are the earthworms doing anything? They're doing a little movement. But once you start seeing food in the system, the soybeans, dramatic increases in their movement and based on their abundance, dramatic increases in the aeration, the infiltration rate. Does that make sense? Functional response to what these earthworms are doing. It, functional response in the soil to what these earthworms are doing in their own functioning. All right, let's take a look at, again at these casts, so. Okay, so we've looked at sort of this, sort of the stability, the structural stability, or I should say the structural creation of structure. We also looked at the aeration. But these casts do something else, okay? These casts, this is, we're looking at a table here that's basically comparative characteristics of earthworm casts versus soil, okay? These are, these are soils that are in Nigeria, and basically what they're doing is they're looking at the casts themselves versus the soils, okay? And they're looking at a number of different things, okay? Silt and clay percentage, if you look at the silt and clay percentage, the earthworm cast, it increases. Okay, actually, let me sit on this side. The bulk density, not that much difference, but it is a little bit less than the native soil. Okay, interestingly enough here, structural stability. This is a really cool piece of information here. Okay, this number basically represents how many raindrops it takes to destroy that aggregate. Okay, so here, number of raindrops required to destroy the structural aggregate. The earthworm cast takes basically 850 raindrops to break it up. This one basically takes 65. Now, what does that tell you about the resilience of a soil to resist raindrop destruction with the presence of earthworms, without the presence of earthworms? With, you certainly have more infiltration, things like that, but with, these aggregates tend to stay together. And we already know the benefits of these aggregates, let alone the benefits that we're going to talk about in a few moments. Okay, cation exchange capacity. We'll talk about nutrients in a second, but look at this. 13, 14 basically to 3.5. The exchangeable calcium, exchangeable potassium, soluble phosphorus, and total nitrogen. Hold off on those, but take a look and notice that in each case we're looking at more nutrients in the cast than in the native soil. Now, does that make you start thinking about what's going on with these casts? Let's take a look at this slide. This is basically a nutrient number, okay? This is basically a nutrient response to these different soils, or it's showing you the amount of nutrients that are in the cast versus the surface of the soil versus at depth. Now, I started the last lecture talking about plants and the rhizosphere. And the, and, the, and the point of that slide was to say, okay, well, we're looking at a, a system where the plants are supplying stuff to the bacteria, and the bacteria in turn are supplying things back to the plants. Well, here's another relationship, or another, uh, yeah, another relationship that's very similar. Because look at what the earthworms are doing. If they are concentrating nutrients in these casts, where do you think the rest of the organisms, organisms in this soil system are going to be concentrating? In the casts. So basically, these are serving as sort of host environments. Now, we're talking about microbial populations. These casts are not very big, but microbes are pretty small as well. So where is a lot of the nutrient cycling occurring? These basically are acting as fertilizer pellets. So we look at total nitrogen. I mean, if you look at basically any one of these, we're seeing basically an increase in nutrient concentration. Okay? Even when we're looking at CN ratios, there's going to be more carbon here and nitrogen, but we're looking at a CN ratio 
This is perhaps the only one that, if we look at these, this is perhaps the only one that perhaps could be considered detrimental. But look at the CN ratios. They're well below 20 to 1. Available phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, potassium, total calcium, total magnesium, percent base saturation. And another very interesting thing here is the pH. Look at these pH numbers. The pH in the cast is around 7. The native soils, they're not that acidic. But if this cast is around 7, what is that saying to me about nutrient availability? Now, the optimum range is actually around 6.5. So we're looking at the top 6. These guys are basically where all the nutrients are, okay, and the maximum availability. Okay? Down here, at below 6 inches and deeper, pH is going down. So you guys remember that curve, right? That nutrient curve? Okay, it sort of maxes out around 6.5 when we look at total nutrient availability. This is kind of really interesting. Okay, and it's indicative of something else. And let me go to this next slide. Beyond this effect of pH being around 7, okay, and the nutrient availability, it turns out that this, this in essence, well, I mean, if you're thinking about these casts, it helps to neutralize the acids and alkalinity of the system that may be present in the soil, therefore making root development and nutrient availability a lot better. But the other interesting thing about these, these, these casts and the tubes that they're making is they basically, as these earthworms are moving through the system, they're basically leaving behind sort of a musical or mucilaginous type of substance that is rich in proteins on the wall of these burrows. So again, the casts and these burrows are basically acting like a rhizosphere. This one organism, in a sense, becomes a keystone organism for a lot of other organisms. Okay? This substance, in turn, serves as an energy source for the microbes. And on top of that, these casts, huge amount of nutrients, this becomes a really important ecosystem, a smaller ecosystem within a larger ecosystem. The concentration of nitrifying microbes have been observed to be about 40% higher in the burrows than in the rest of the soil. Now these burrows, certainly if you think about it from a rooting sense, these burrows are nice large pores, nice light hole, lots of nutrients. This is also going to serve as a nice highway for roots to start expanding through. And so, so we're seeing what these earthworms are doing, and we're seeing what they're what their influence is on the larger soil system. It's not just them eating and surviving for themselves, but their impact on the rest of the system. Or I should say their relationship with the rest of the system. So questions on this? These guys are really, really cool. Go. Well, these casts have microbes. I mean, when they're in, the, I mean, the, no there's no separating the two. Because um, uh, earthworms basically are, they're sort of like cows, and that their gut is, they have all different kinds of organisms in their guts. Uh, and when the cast comes out, those organisms are going with them. And they're eating the soil, too. So they're, you know, they're bringing it back. Because they have to have these, they basically have to have like croup rocks, like chickens and things like that. They have to have rocks inside their, or sand grains, not rocks, inside their, Stomach, so they can grind stuff up. They don't have teeth like us that we can masticate stuff. Go. When they're measuring with the cast, is it only the cast, or could it also be the earthworms themselves? No, at this point, they're, they're literally only measuring the casts. They're not taking the earthworms and grinding them up and calculating. That sounded bad. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they're only looking at the casts. They're not looking at the earthworms themselves. Well, when the earthworms die, which they will, they're going to fertilize the soil too. But the big thing about the earthworms is, first off, they're this huge amount of aeration that they're doing, the drive, and they're moving the system. But these casts are literally like fertilizer pellets. Now, the reality is they're concentrating it. Now, it's not like they're going out and buying fertilizer and bringing it in. 
It's not like th this organic matter that they're eating is, is in the system already. But what they're doing is they're basically taking it, they're processing, and they're putting it in a very specific spot, and they're concentrating it. Okay? And it tends to be you know, in these surfaces, and, cer and certainly sort of at the surface. Andrew. <laughs> They are making it more available by putting it in this pH, okay, and they are concentrating it. Now, if this, I mean, if they, if their guts basically were like our guts, and we're, you know, and putting out pH is 3.5 or whatever like that, like our stomachs are, you know, this would be a very different scenario. This, this stuff might be there, but it certainly would not be as available. They, no, what they do, they don't neutralize the pH of the soil surrounding them. What they do is they neutralize the pH of the cast. And so the cast basically serves, I mean, it, it's a fertilizer pellet, but it's, because it's at this sort of neutral pH, the availability of the nutrients that are in that cast are so much higher than the nu availability of the nutrients that are outside the cast. Does that make sense? Go. Well, that's, that's an interesting, the forest, uh, worms in forested systems. You guys have heard me say that the wor there's no native worms around here, right? Um, and the fact that the worms are moving into uh, the forest, they're changing the nature of these forests. Because what they're going to be doing is these worms are going to be harvesting all the biomass that's above ground. And these forests adapted without worms in, or developed without worms in them. Okay. Now, when these worms go into the system, what they're doing is they're processing this material and, and making it more available. Now, if it's not used, what's going to happen to it? It's going to be lost from the system. And we often see when earthworms move into these forested systems, they, be, they move from what we would have called very tight systems, where the nutrients were basically recycled again and again and again inside the system, to what we call leaky systems. Because this becomes so much more available, and if the organisms that are in that forest can't use it, this, system, this stuff is lost from the system. It's leached away. And the, the big organism that's using this stuff is not the microbial population that's sort of recycling it. It's the tree roots. The trees can only take up, the trees can only take up so much nutrient at a time. And if they don't use it up, it's gone. Is, is that sort of? Now, I don't, want, I, want, I don't want earthworms to have a bad reputation, but on the other hand, I don't want them to have a good reputation. I mean, this is like the right thing at the right place. Earthworms tend to be really good for sort of annual crop locations, your garden. On the other hand, they tend to be very bad for the forests in the Northeast because the forests in the Northeast were developed without this type of nutrient regime, this nutrient cycling. They were more adapted to a slower nutrient recycling, where the fungi were basically doing most of the work and the microorganisms, not the earthworms. This goes, you know, in a sense, this goes back to that, um, that, bag, that bag experiment slide that I showed last lecture, where we had different leaf litter bags, and the leaf litter bags had different hole apertures in them. And the larger the hole aperture, the more complete, I guess it's bad, maybe not the right way to say it, the more complete the decomposition was. Okay, because you got larger organisms in there basically breaking things up. Okay, well, that's what's going to happen here. You know, yes, it's not going to stop decomposition, but this increases the rate of decomposition. In fact, the reality is this is probably not increasing it all that much, but what it's doing is it's making it so much more available that we're losing the nutrients from the system. Okay. And on top of that, there's the whole issue about the uh, changing from large nut trees to small seed trees, because the stuff that they're eating is the duff layer. And once you eat the duff layer, all the nuts and things like that become very easy to find, which means they get grazed out by the deer, which means the large nut trees don't have a next generation. It's all the small seeded trees. Does this, we, I think we talked about this, right? Did we talk about this? Yeah, OK. Feel good about this? Any questions? Now, I don't want you guys to leave thinking, well, earthworms are the only movers and shakers. 
Uh, there's a lot of other organisms that are in the system. If we think about their functional, what they're doing structurally, what we're doing, they're doing aeration and, and infiltration rate. Certainly, these guys, termites, are, have a huge role. Okay? These guys, you know, they, they're digging huge, it's, you're looking at above ground biomass, but they're digging huge tunnels underneath and they're bringing material up to build this. Okay? So we're seeing a lot of sort of cycling here. Here, here they, you can sort of see these organisms right in here. They're basically making these holes in the ground. They're pulling stuff up and they're building these sort of shafts. Okay? Now, interestingly enough, this shaft is basically used for air conditioning. Okay? Hot air rises, so in essence, you're cooling the system. But it's also used as a refuser for, you know, for when there's flooding and things like that. But this shaft is basically changing the atmospheric dynamics of this whole system just because they're basically making a chimney. Here's another sort of example you can see. Here's the beginning. Uh, this is an ant system, actually, not a termite system. But you can see the beginning of this pile of material. But you can see how they've been spreading this material out. So they're basically redistributing the subsoil up to the surface. And they're bringing organic material down. OK, so what role is that going to have in the ecosystem of the soil? They're mechanically, kind of like the earthworms, they're mechanically taking biomass from up here and taking it down, and they're taking the subsoil, and they're taking it up. So in essence, they're mixing the material. Huge functional role. All right, so we've got this question. Uh, so, so organisms play this critical role in the soil dynamics, sort of the function. But I want to ask this next question. But why where it is? Okay. But why is it where it is? Okay. And, and let's think about it in this. We're going to still talk about carbon and nutrient cycling, but let's also think about their growth and the constraints and adaptions. Why are these organisms where they are? Okay, and I want to look at a different, a different model system, and I'm, this is not an individual. We're going to use soil bacteria as our, our discussion point. So think about soil organisms, the soil bacteria in particular, their growth, their spread and their survival, the constraints and adaptions to that growth and spread in survival, and then how carbon and nutrient cycling has a role in this, or what is the role. Um, so what are, what, what are the limitations? Their limitations are pretty much like ours. Growth is usually limited by climate, so temperature and moisture, temperature and water. pH, bigger role in a sense for them than us, because this is that issue of nutrient availability. Oxygen aerobic versus anaerobic, and the nutrients, especially that carbon stock, that food stock. Okay? Their nutritional uses, their needs, there may be carbon, but if it's not in a usable form, it's not going to do them any good. So it has to have that utility, and it also has to have this issue of nutrients. They have to have the essential nutrients. If I have plenty of carbon, but if I have no nutrients, it doesn't matter whether I have the carbon. So usually when we see a growth, uh, when we look at growth, we, have, we often see a, a, a plot that looks like this. This is a log scale over here, but this is basically a number of bacteria per, grain of, uh, per gram of, sand, of soil. Okay? And this is a time scale, and this one's day. Okay? Now, <coughs> the thought is what we're adding as a food stock. Here's we're adding the material, and you see a response in growth. Now, this could be numbers, but this could also be the CO2, CO2 evolution, again. Okay, so basically what we're seeing is we're seeing a rapid response, an increase under favorable conditions. Okay, in this case, the favorable condition is the food source. Okay, but the favorable condition has to include all of these limiters. The climate, the pH, the oxygen, as well as the food stock. Okay, uh, these organisms in, in optimal conditions, these, these guys can double cell numbers in two to three hours. They have, ex because of this cycling of their population, they can have a rapid response to a change in conditions. Okay? They basically multiply to take advantage of food sources, and they're also looking at a replacement. I mean, these guys are not immortal. Okay? So we're looking at a replacement population as well. You guys remember me saying, you know, I, and I never can get the right number, but you guys remember me talking about E. coli and the fact that if E. coli had optimum growth and never died, 
that basically rule this universe or this galaxy or solar system, whatever it is, in a couple weeks. Okay, they, they grow that fast. Now, the reality is they die and they get eaten and they never have, they very rarely have optimum situations. So you're not going to see this type of curve. Okay, so that's controlling their growth. What's controlling their spread? Okay, well, a lot of these organisms are moved around by things like us. We eat something, we have E. coli, we go to the bathroom, and that material comes out of us. Wherever we have moved to, that's where it's, it, those organisms are going. Okay? But they're moving on our skin, they're moving all different ways. Okay? They're also moving by air, or dust moths, I should say, that dust that organisms get picked up and carried. Okay? And because of this, it is extremely difficult to maintain a sterile system. Okay? We went up to the greenhouses last week. You know, and you saw a lot of the things that we do to maintain sort of sterile conditions when we need to. But even in those scenarios, we're still running into these issues of contamination. Okay? Their survival, they're remark they have a remarkable set of survival skills. Okay? The reality is that soils are usually too dry or too moist or too cold or too hot. You know, there's nutrition deficits. So they have a lot of survival tactics or survival traits. Okay? Some of those survival traits are basically dormancy. Well, they basically go into hibernation. They'll become inactive. In often cases, they'll become literally desiccated. Okay? And when they go into dormancy, there might in fact be a really high mortality rate. But because of that growth response that they have, if just a few of them survive, that population will bounce right back when optimum or better conditions present themselves. Okay? They also have spore formation. Many fungi, many bacteria have this ability. And this spore formation may, in fact, survive boiling. Okay? This is the Giardia cryptosporidium type of issue with water. Okay? Also, a number of them <coughs> have filamentous growth habits. Actinomyces is a really good example of this. This is a filamentous bacteria. This is, what you're looking at here is not one organism but a multitude of them that are basically in relationship with each other. They'll grow up into the nutrient area up here, but it happens to be dry. They'll also grow down into the cool moist zone, which doesn't have nutrients. And basically, they'll share this material across these two zones. Does that make sense? Sort of a communal relationship. Somebody's harvesting the nutrients, somebody's harvesting the water, and they transfer through the system. That's pretty cool for a survival st strategy. Now, there are a number of constraints and adaptions that they have to, have to deal with. First, they have certainly physical constraints. There's these climatic issues. Basically, larger than uh, temperatures higher than 35 degrees Celsius will basically kill the less heat tolerant organisms. Okay? And that response will induce spore formation in a lot of organisms. Spores tend to be more resistant to the heat. Okay? Temperatures lower than zero degrees Celsius freezing point basically it stops biological activity. Basically, it will stop microbial growth. Okay, so we have these barriers. They also have water constraints. Okay, moderate drought will dramatically reduce the population of rotifers and nematodes and protozoa, as well. Basically, all mobile organisms. Okay, in extreme droughts, we're basically going to be lo losing out at to fungi as well as bacteria. Okay, and the bacteria are going to start forming fo spores. Okay, when I have excessive water, we're going from an aerobic to an anaerobic system. I'm going to basically see a shift from aerobic organisms to anaerobic organisms. The anaerobic organisms are the bacterial populations. Okay, unless you're a higher order species that has some ability to transfer oxygen down, certainly a renkema type of things in plants, the system goes anaerobic, you're going to have to leave or you're going to die. So there are also chemical constraints. Um, soil acidity is a big one. Uh, soil acidity because of this issue of nutrient availability. But certainly, if you have an organism that needs calcium and the system starts going acidic, there's going to be a shortage of calcium. Okay? Also, if the system goes tox uh, acidic, you're going to have toxicity of aluminum. You also can potentially have manganese issues. Um, the reality is that species vary in their tolerances. 
species vary in their tolerances because they've adapted to certain situations. They've moved to basically filling certain niches in the ecosystems. Okay? If I have a system that's acidic and it's killing off everything else, that might actually be an advantage to somebody who can deal with aluminum toxicity. Okay? Uh, and I've run out of time, haven't I? Okay, guys, uh, happy Friday. Be free. <laughs>